Hello everyone and welcome to another online tutorial. So today we'll go through lectures 33 through 36. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with some rapid fire warm up. Uh, doing it on my own is a little bit weird compared to doing it in class, but let L be a linear transform from Rn to Rm with the standard matrix of L. We can ask you to define a few things. First, what's the domain of L? Well, in general, the domain of any function is going to be the set that I'm mapping from. So in this case, it's just going to be Rn. Next, I can ask, what is the codomain of L? Well, in general, the codomain of any function will be the set that I'm mapping to written here. So in this case, it'll just be Rn. Okay, next up, I can say, what is the kernel of L? Well, let's just try to visualize this first a little bit. So here I could have this little circle here representing Rn, and I could have this circle here representing Rm. And I can draw this T as a mapping from Rn to Rm. So a natural question that I could ask is, what are all of the things in the domain that get mapped to the zero vector in Rm? Okay, so we know zero will get mapped to zero because t is linear, and we know some other stuff over here will get mapped to zero. We call this set the kernel. So this set here would be the kernel of L. Okay, so from here, in terms of the mathematics, we say the kernel of L is the set of all x and r in, so all of the vectors over here, such that L of x is equal to zero. Okay, so we can notice that if L is linear, then it has a standard matrix, and we've seen a set that looks similar to the kernel before, right? In particular, if L is linear, we know that L of x can be rewritten as the standard matrix of L times the vector x, right? And if I do this substitution here, I see that the kernel of L is simply the same thing as the null space of the standard matrix for L. So kernel lives over here. The next thing can, I can ask for is, hey, if I compute L of any of the vectors in here, I'm guaranteed to get something in Rm because that's my codomain, but I'm not guaranteed to be able to get to all of the vectors in Rm. So there's some subset over here of Rm that will contain the zero vector that we will call the range of L. And this range of L simply tells me what all of the things over here ultimately get mapped to. Okay, so in terms of the definition of the range of L, we say that the range of L is the set of Lx for all x's in Rn. So it's just everything that I can get to by taking L of some vector in the domain. So again, if we use the fact that L is a linear transform here, I could rewrite this Lx as the standard matrix of L times the vector x. Now this is something that we've seen before. That's just simply the column space for the standard matrix of L. Okay, so in practice, if a function is linear, or I'm dealing with a linear transform, I can just note that the kernel is equal to the null space for the standard matrix, and the range is equal to the column space of the standard matrix, and I can simply compute the null space and column space respectively to compute these two sets. If, on the other hand, my function is not linear, I'm stuck with using these definitions here. So you definitely should memorize the definitions and the equivalents over here in terms of the standard matrix. Okay, so just briefly, since I've already generated this picture to be used in the new version of the course notes when they come out, uh, this is just kind of a higher, prettier version of this picture here, just in case you find it useful. Okay, so going on. What is the identity transform from Rn to Rn? Well, the identity transform is simply going to be the transform such that identity of x is equal to x for all x in Rn. So this is just the transform that sends x to itself. So note that the standard matrix for id is simply going to be the identity matrix where this is the n by n identity matrix. So just for completion, n by n here. So this is kind of the function analog of the identity matrix. Okay, so next, what does it mean for L to be one-to-one -one or injective? Well, there's a natural picture that goes along with this, so I'll just kind of draw it here as we go. So for every point in the codomain of a function, 
So if I have some function here, L, then this is my codomain. If for every point over here, there is either no points over here or at most one point that maps to it, then we say that the function is one-to-one. -one. So for instance, this would be an example of a one-to-one -one function. I could have another point over here that nothing maps to. But if I drew another point here, this red line is not acceptable for this to be one-to-one. -one. So red's a no-go. But I could, say, take this point and map it over here. That would still be one-to-one. -one. Okay. So in terms of the definition, we say if for all x1 and x2 in Rn, so these two points here, if L of x1 is equal to L of x2, so if two things map to the same point, so if this thing's my L of x1 is equal to L of x2, then it follows that x1 is equal to x2. So here, if two points map to the same thing, then those two points are equal. Okay. So in practice, it really just means for anything over here, one or fewer things get mapped to it by L. So next we can talk about one-to-one -one functions. So the basic idea here is I have the codomain and I also have the range, right? So sometimes the codomain and the range are different. So for instance, the range could be this thing that's these points in here, but the codomain could be everything out here. And in other cases, the range and the codomain could be the exact same thing. They could have the same points. And when the range is equal to the codomain, we call that function onto. So for instance, if I had two points here and both of these points mapped to this point over here, that would not be an onto function since I have this point over here that nothing gets mapped to. On the other hand, if the second point mapped over here, this would be an example of an onto function. So in terms of the mathematical definition, we say if for all y and rm, so everything in the codomain, if there exists an x in rn, so there's something in the domain such that L of x is equal to y, then we say that L is onto or surjective. So again, note both of these definitions are valid whether or not the function L is linear or not. Okay. So finally, we can talk about a one-to-one -one correspondence or a bijective function. So if L is both one-to-one -one and onto, we say it is bijective. So the picture that I have here is an example of a bijective function. Okay, so I kind of drew the pictures here on the side, but let's go through the pictures that I have in the slides that demonstrate these. So just recall that if f is a one-to-one -one function, then for all x1 and x2 and r in, if l of x1 is equal to l of x2, then x1 is equal to x2. So we can visualize a function that's one-to-one -one and one that's not one-to-one. -one. Okay, so if I have this is my domain and this is my codomain, I could simply do this mapping here and that would be a one-to-one -one function. Further, I could have, say, mapped x2 to y2, or x3 to y5, or x1 to y5. All of those would also be on to. On the other hand, if I have something where two things map to the same point, so here x1 and x2 are distinct points, but they're getting mapped to y1, then this would not be an on to function. So here I could map x to anything else, or x3 to anything else here, and it would still not be one to one, since x1 and x2 both map to y1. On the other hand, we can now visualize onto functions. So again, by definition, if f from rn to rn is an onto function, then for all y in the codomain, there exists an x in the domain such that l of x is equal to y. So just visualizing this, for an example of an onto function, I could say take x1 map it there, y, x1, x2 map it there, x3 could map to y2, x4 could map to y3, and x5 could map here. This is onto since everything in the codomain, all four of these points, have something that map to it. Okay, to see something that's not onto, I just have to have at least one thing over here that nothing maps to. So for instance, if I do this, there's two things here that don't have anything that maps to it from the domain, therefore this would not be onto. So note that one-to-one -one and onto-ness are two separate concepts, right? So this here is a function that is onto but not one-to-one, -one, right? There's two different distinct values that map to y2, so it's not one-to-one. -one. On the other hand, this is one-to-one -one, but not onto since nothing maps to say x2 or y2 or y5. Okay. 
Okay, so let's talk about some ways that we can classify linear transforms from R2 into R2 or other spaces as well. So in R2, we can classify the matrices of some linear transforms based off what they do geometrically. So here I have the different transforms that are considered in the text along with the matrices that give me this transform and some images to show what how the transform works. So here I could take a vector and I can just rotate it, right? So if I take a vector, say on the unit circle, I could rotate it around by an angle of theta. Now, if I do this rotation by theta here, the matrix that I would need to multiply the red vector x by to get x of theta would simply be this matrix here. So in R2, if you have a matrix that looks like this, then that would be a rotation matrix. So this of course can be generalized to R3, for instance, I could take the matrix with 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 here, and I could take these terms here and use them to fill up the rest of these terms here. That would represent one type of uh, rotation that I can do in R3. The other two rotations, rotating about the y and z axes in R3, can be obtained by simply moving these terms here to be in the column and row for whichever axes you want to be in. Okay. So from here, we can now talk about stretching. So I could take this vector here and I could stretch it this way or this way, or I could also stretch it vertically just by adjusting the X or the Y component. So doing this gives me two different types of stretching. I have this stretching where I have a coefficient up here and the stretching where I have a co coefficient down here. So now for stretches, we're going to force S and T to both be greater than zero. And let's just look at what this looks like. So I can do stretches here and then I could do stretches vertically like this. Okay, next I can talk about dilations or contractions. So if I take a vector and just scale it to make it longer or shorter, we call it a dilation or a contraction respectively. So to do this with the matrix, I simply put D along the diagonals where D is a number that's greater than zero. So here if D is greater than one, it stretches. If it's less than one, it contracts. So here, just briefly, why would I want to put these restrictions that S, T, and D are greater than zero? Well, if D, for instance, is less than zero, I would get a vector that would maybe look something like this. That is a rotation by uh, theta's 180 degrees or pi, as well as a dilation. So the reason why I have this restriction on S, T, and D is to separate rotations from stretching and dilations. So finally, I can talk about shears. So the best way to kind of think of these uh, physically is if I were to have like a bunch of Play-Doh, like if this was a moldable object, and I say put my little hand on the top and drag it this way, it would drag the solid with it. That, if it's represented by a linear shear, would be this linear transformation here. So the matrices for R2 that I can use to talk about shears is put a S up here on the upper diagonal or a T down here on the lower diagonal. Okay, so again, all three of these generalize for R3. Stretches, you can just stretch along the diagonal. So here, here, or the third I, if, or the third one, if you're in R3. For dilations, I just take the D times the identity matrix. And for shears, I have the off diagonal terms that I can pick. So here I have one, 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 and I'll have a term here, a term here, and a term here, and three terms below the diagonal. These kind of scriggled terms would be my shearing terms. Okay, so that kind of TLDR out of the way, let's go back to some computations. So here, if I let D be a linear transform from R3 to R4, be defined by this thing here, where the first term's x3 plus x2, the next term's x3, then x2, then x1 plus x2 plus x3. I can ask you to do some stuff with L. So the first thing I could ask is to state the domain and codomain. Then I could ask you to find the standard matrix L of L and use it to compute L of 1, 2, 3. And finally, I can ask you to find a basis for the kernel of L and the range of L and to state the dimensions of those two subspaces. And finally, I could ask you, is L 1 to 1? Is L on 2? So we'll do these one at a time. So what's the domain of L? Well, that's the thing that L maps from. So the domain is just going to be R3. Okay. So the codomain is the thing that L maps to. This is just going to be R4. Note the codomain is different from the range in general. And in this question, it will be different from the range and you'll kind of see why. Okay. So now I need to find the standard matrix for L. So how do I find the standard matrix? Well, there's a few ways I can go about doing it. 
I could do the technique that's done in your book in a few places where you try to factor this out to write it as a matrix by writing it as a matrix times the vector x that has components x1, x2, and x3. Or I could simply say, hey, the domain of this thing's R3. So if I take the standard basis for R3, E1, E2, E3, and evaluate L for these values to get those column vectors, then I get the standard matrix for L. Okay, so doing this, I, for the E1 term, I want to compute L of 1, 0, 0, right? So here you can just notice that when I plug 1, 0, 0 in for the terms x1, x2, and x3 respectively, uh, here I only am really picking up the coefficients of x1, right? So if I do that, you can note there's no x1 here, so I'll get a 0. There's no x1 here, so I get a 0. There's no x1 here, so I get a 0, but the coefficient of x1 here is 1, so I get a 1. So this would give me the column vector 0, 0, 0, 1. Now if I repeat this for x2, I'm going to get a 1x2 from here, 0 from here, 1 from here, and a 1 from here. So it'll be 1, 0, 1, 1. And finally, I'll get 1, 1, 0, and 1. Okay, so that is the standard matrix for L. Now, if I want to use L to compute L of 1, 2, 3, I need a rule to figure out how to compute L from the standard matrix. Well, the general trick here is that L of a vector is going to be equal to the standard matrix of L times that vector x. Now, this trick only works if there is a standard matrix. And in general, there is only a standard matrix if the function is a linear transform. Okay, so if it's not linear, it doesn't make sense to talk about the standard matrix. So I couldn't do number two. Okay, so here I now want to compute L of 1, 2, 3. And that's just going to be L times this vector here. Okay. That's a straightforward matrix vector multiplication. And if I do this, I take row times column. So here I get uh, 2 times 3 for the first term. Then I'm just going to pick up a 3 from this 1, a 2 from this component, and a 1 plus 2 plus 3 here, or simply 5, 3, 2, 6. Okay, pretty straightforward, hopefully. Now I can go about uh, rewriting this in the kind of standard form that I write a function and just write it as a point. Okay. So next, I want to find a basis for the kernel of L and the range of L, and then state the dimensions of those two spaces. Well, recall that the kernel of L, well, what was that precisely? Well, if I remember, like if you ever forget the definition of kernel and just remember this picture, here I have my uh, domain, in this case it's R3, and here I have my range, or sorry, my codomain, in this case it's R4, and I have the zero vector here. So the kernel is just all of the stuff here that gets mapped to the zero vector. Okay, so if you ever forget it, just remember this equation or this uh, picture here. So from there, this will be the set of all x's such that L of x is equal to zero. And in particular, the x's need to come from this set. So this will simply be the set of all x's in Rn such that Lx is equal to zero. Now, since L is a linear function, this Lx is the same thing as the standard matrix of L times the vector x. And we've seen this set before. This is just the null space of the standard matrix. So just rehashing it again because it's important and you should know how to do these derivations between the two different sets. Okay, so from here, if I want to compute the kernel, I can just compute the null space. Okay. And to compute the null space, I want to row reduce L augmented with zero. So I just build this matrix and do a simple row reduction. So when I row reduce this matrix, I get this. And recall, you don't technically have to write this row of zeros. It's up to you. I just did it here to make it a bit more clear since it's been a while since we've done that trick. Okay, <clears throat> so recall from the previous slide that this was true. Thus, the null space of L, well, what is this? I need to interpret this augmented matrix to get the solutions. So if I look here, every column has a leading one. That tells me that I will have no free parameters in my solution. So if I turn this into a system of equations, it just tells me x1 is 0, x2 is 0, and x3 is 0. So if I put these together, the null space is a collection of only one vector, and that's going to be the zero vector where this is the zero vector in R3. Okay, so now just to be overly cautious with this example to 
draw the emphasis that the null space of L and the kernel of L are technically different sets that just so happen to be equal when a function is linear, I can note, hey, the kernel of L is the same thing as the null space of L, and the kernel, and thus the kernel of L will simply be the set that only contains the zero vector. Okay, so just a thing to mention here, just while I'm here, do be careful that you always put these brackets when talking about the null space of something if you're talking about a linear operator L. So if I were to write the null space of just L, this is saying the null space of this thing that's a linear function. Linear functions don't have null spaces. Only matrices have null spaces. So you need these brackets to let me know that you're talking about a matrix. If you don't put the brackets, it's conceptually wrong and you will probably lose points. So just be cautious with that. The notation and the way you write things really matters here. Okay, going forward, I wanted to find a basis for the kernel, right? So what is a basis for the set that just has the zero vector? Well, this thing is just the null set. So this is one of the degenerate cases of a basis, and it just really comes from the definition of a basis. So what's the dimension? Well, this has nothing in it, so the dimension is just going to be zero. So a kind of convenient way that you can think about the reason why the basis for this set would have nothing in it is to think of our physical intuition of the idea of dimension. So this is by no means a proof, but it's just a way that you can help remember slash visualize what's happening here. So if I give you a line, a line is a one-dimensional object because you can really travel in one direction in it, right? I have one direction vector that uniquely defines it. I can go this way or that way, but it's really this direction or negative that direction. If I have a plane, which I won't draw here, but if I have a plane, there's two directions. There's this way and say that way. Now, if I'm at a single point, how many other points can I move to? Well, I can't, I'm stuck at the dot, I can't go anywhere. So there's no directions I can travel in, therefore intuitively this should have dimension zero, and by the definition of dimension, that means that the basis for that set contains zero elements, and hey, that's the null set. So again, not a proof, just a way that you can kind of help remember this if you ever forget it for say the final or years from now when you go back and you need to use this in your career. Okay, so now let's do the thing with the range. Recall that the range is, well, what was the range again? Well, let's draw that picture again. So here I have my domain, here I have my codomain, so in this case R3 and R4. So the range was the set of all of the things over here that I could get to by taking L of the things in the domain. So this range here would simply be this set over here that I can get by taking L of X for any arbitrary X in R3. So if I write that using set notation, this is the collection of LX where X is in RN. And recall, in this case, L is linear. So LX is the same thing as the standard matrix of L times the vector x. And hey, this set we've seen before, that again is just the column space. Okay, so from here we know the range of L is just the column space of the standard matrix of L and rehash y. So now I need to compute the column space. Well, how do I do that? Well, here I have this matrix L, right? And if you recall, the column space is simply the set of all the linear combinations of the column vectors. And if I want to simplify this out, all I have to do is row reduce these terms here to figure out which vectors I need to keep. Okay, so if I take this thing and row reduce it, I get this. So for homework, since you've already actually computed the RREF up here, you could reuse some of your information. But just for the slides to make it clear, we're row reducing it here. So now the next thing you need to ask is which columns do I need to take? Well, I need all of the columns that uh, are required to span the space. Thus, I need all of the columns that have a leading one in them. So I need to take which columns? All three of them, since they all three have these leading ones. So now the next question is, do I take my columns from here or do I take them from here? So for the row space, it doesn't matter where I take the columns from, but for the column space, it does. By row reducing, I've changed the span, so I need to grab the columns from here. 
So if I do this, a basis for the column space of L, which is ultimately going to be a basis for the range of L, and thus a basis for the range of L, will simply be the first column vector here, the second column vector here, and the third column vector here. Okay, so again, for your homework, you don't need to explicitly state this out in this way, but you do need to mention somewhere that since L is linear, the range of L is equal to the column of column space of the standard matrix for L. That needs to be stated somewhere uh, within your problem. It doesn't have to be stated like this, though. Okay, so now the last thing I wanted to do was to find the dimension. Well, clearly, range of L has dimension what? Well, there's one, two, three vectors here, so the dimension is three. Okay, good, good so far. So now I need to determine if L is one to one or if L is odd to. Not or, but need to determine the truth values for these two statements. So recall that L was a function from R3 to R4 and it was given by this. I don't actually end up needing this information from because I've already computed the stuff I need, but it's just kind of useful to rewrite it here. Okay, so how can I tell if a function is one-to-one? -one? Well, in general, the definition of one-to-one -one is if for all x1 and x2, so x1 and x2, in my domain, so in this case R3, if L of x1 is equal to L of x2, then that implied that x1 was equal to x2. Okay, so this implies that x1 is equal to x2. Okay, so this is my formal definition of something being one to one. So if this was not a linear function, I would have to pick an arbitrary x1 and x2, not particular numbers, about like variables for x1 and x2, I'd have to take this function, plug in my two vectors, x1 and x2, and just correcting an error here, this is r3 and these need vector hats, but plug in my two vectors, x1 and x2, into this equation here, set those two expressions equal to each other, and solve for the vectors to show that they're the same vector. Okay, I do not have to do that if L is linear. All of the hard heavy lifting was done in the proof of theorem 35.11. So in the theorem 35.11, we know that a linear function L with the domain of R3 is one-to-one -one if and only if the rank of the standard matrix of L is equal to three. In general, if I change this to an Rn and change this to an N, that's my theorem 35.11 and all its general glory. But here, I don't need that. I just need this particular application of theorem 35.11. So if I can show that the rank of L or the rank of the standard matrix for L is three, then I know that L is one to one. Otherwise, if it, the rank of the standard matrix of L is not three, then I know L is not one to one. Okay, so chasing this out. Uh, earlier, I found that the dimension of the null space of the standard matrix of L was zero. And I'm ultimately going to use this to show that the rank of the standard matrix of L is three. So you could do this directly, but I kind of want to rehash that the system rank theorem is a thing. So from the system of rank theorem, I know that the rank of the standard matrix of L will be the size of the thing that I'm mapping from. So in this case, three minus the dimension of the null space of L. And by the size of, I meant the dimensionality of the domain. Okay. So here I know this thing is just zero, so this is three, and thus L is one to one. So similarly, if I wanted to show that L was on to, if it's not linear, I have to apply the definition. So in particular, for this case, I'd have to show for all vectors Y and R4, because that's the codomain, there exists a vector X in R3, such that L of X is simply equal to Y. So if it wasn't linear, I would have to do this by definition. But luckily for L, us, L is a linear function. Therefore, I can use a theorem in the text. Theorem 36.2 states that if L is a linear function with codomain of R4, then it is onto if and only if the rank of L is equal to four, or the rank of the standard matrix for L is equal to four. Okay, again, this generalizes to be an N here and an N here. But in this case, my codomain was R4 here. So I can just use this simplification of 36.2 here. So I know the rank of L is three. 
and I know 3 is not equal to 4, thus L is not on 2. And again, by the rank of L, I mean the rank for the standard matrix of L. It just gets tedious to say that all the time, but do make sure you put the brackets, otherwise it is not correct. Okay, so that's everything for that question. Let's go on to another problem. So let L from R2 to R2 be a linear transform defined by this function here. I could ask you, if possible, find the inverse function for this linear transform. And if there is no inverse, explain why not. And if there is an inverse, verify that it is the inverse. So a priori, if I give you a function like this, say L of X is equal to Y, if you wanted to invert this, you would have to go through the process of plugging in an arbitrary thing here for X and solving for this X1 and X2 in terms of Y. That is tedious. And in the case where this thing is a linear transform, I can avoid doing that. So just to give an example where you can't avoid that, say if I was considering the function x squared uh, with the domain of all positive real numbers, if I wanted to find the inverse of this function f of x is equal to x squared, uh, what would I have to do in this case? Well, I would have to take x squared and set that equal to y. I'd have to take the square root of both sides and say x is equal to positive the square root of y because I'm dealing with positive everything. Uh, and then from here, I would simply say, oh, this thing is my inverse function. So f inverse of this function of x would simply be the square root of x. So here I just changed my dummy variable. Okay, so in the case where things are linear, I don't have to do all of this, and instead things are cleaner. So let's just examine what to do here. Well, if I'm dealing with L of x, since L is linear, instead of dealing in function world, if I will, so function world over here, I can deal with matrix world. Okay, so in matrix world, I can rewrite this thing as L times the vector x, right? So now, if I just consider this vector L, I can invert this, right? So I can talk about the inverse of the standard matrix for L. We know how to do that, we've done it before. So using this thing, it turns out that I can find the inverse of L of X simply by taking this inverse of the standard matrix, if it exists, and multiplying it by an arbitrary vector X. Okay, so let's show exactly why this works. Well, if L inverse of X is equal to this, then L of L inverse of X, what is this going to be equal to? Well, L inverse of X, that's just the standard matrix of L inverted, right? That's how I defined it. And L of X, well, L is linear, so that's going to be the standard matrix of L times the thing that was in here. Well, that's just L, uh, the standard matrix here, inverse of X like this. So here, matrix multiplication is associative, so I could rewrite this as the standard matrix for L times the standard matrix for L inverted, all times X. Hey, this thing is just the identity mapping of X, and IX is just equal to X. Okay, so that's kind of a proof for why this will work. So what we're going to do here is do this process here. So the first thing I need to do is to compute the standard matrix. Well, the domain of L is R2, so the standard matrix would simply be L of E1, comma L of E2. So here, L of E1, well, if I look at the coefficient for X1, that gives me 1, 1. L of E2, if I look at the coefficients here, that gives me 1 of negative 1. Standard matrix computed. So I've now done this computation here. I've now gone from function world over to here. So now I want to invert this. So how do I invert it? Well, I use the matrix inversion algorithm to find the inverse if it exists. Might not be a thing, but it could be a thing. So let's try to find out if it's a thing. So matrix inversion algorithm, first step I do is I take L and I augment it with I. So this thing, L with the two by two identity matrix, and then I row reduce it. And once I do that, I get this. So is there an inverse? Well, this is the identity matrix. Therefore, there is an inverse. What is the inverse? Well, the inverse is just this stuff here. So the inverse for the standard matrix of L, or the inverse of the standard matrix for L, would simply be this. 
So now I'm down here at inverse world. So now recall L is this. I'll use that kind of at the bottom of the slides over here. But before continuing, let's show that the matrix of L inverse is in fact the inverse of L. It's good to check our work. How can we do this? Well, we can note that L times L inverse is this thing times this thing. So just direct computations, that times that gives me the first term. This times this gives me this term here, which will be zero. This times this gives me that term, which will be zero. And this times this gives me this term, which will be one. So if I chase this out, that is the identity matrix. So since this is I, that verifies that these are in fact inverse matrices of each other. Okay. So now I can find the inverse of L by just computing this thing over here, right? So to do this, I simply take L inverse times X, well, the inverse of the standard matrix of L times the vector X1, X2. Well, that's just this thing and straightforward computation, that times that gives me this term here and this dotted with that gives me this term here. So now I can write this in kind of more, more traditional form like this, just saying this is the first point comma the second point. Okay. So now that I have this L inverse, I was told to verify that this is in fact the inverse of L. So how do I do this? Well, this will be the inverse function of L if L of L inverse of some vector X is equal to X. So in other words, in terms of functions, if this composition here is equal to the identity function. So explicitly to confirm that this is the inverse of L, we'll show that this composition is ID, where ID is the two by two identity function. So again, I use ID instead of I, just so I don't confuse ID with the uh, identity matrix up there. Okay, so L of L inverse of this. Well, L inverse of this thing is just this stuff here. So that'll be L of the first point, comma, the second point. So how do I compute L of this? Well. L of x1, x2, the first component is x1 plus x2. So the first component here will be this thing plus this thing. So explicitly, this is the first term here, and this with the wiggles is the second term over here. Okay, and L of the second term will be x1 minus x2. So it'll simply be this term here. So that term minus the wiggly term here. Okay, so a direct computation from here, this with that gives me x1, these cancel. Over here, the x1s cancel, and this with this give me x2. So this is in fact x1 comma x2. Thus, L of L inverse of x is x, therefore L of L inverse is the identity mapping. So from here, we can conclude that L inverse is indeed the inverse of L. Okay, so oftentimes you'll kind of notice that, hey, if I want to do something in say function world, Doing this isn't immediately obvious. It can be very ugly to do, but if the function is linear, I can instead find the standard matrix, do stuff with the standard matrix to get the thing that I wanted to find originally. This kind of circumnavigating by going this way is a very common thing in math, not just with functions, but for many other topics. Okay, let's go on to the next topic here, the determinant and the adjugate. So here, if m is this thing, I want to compute the determinant, compute the adjugate, and use this to compute the inverse. So how do I do to compute the determinant? Well, this notation here, firstly, is another notation for the determinant, just as an aside. So from here, I take the product of these two things minus the product of those two things. This, which is just negative two. So this is the definition that we are taking for the determinant for this class. There are definitions that have better, uh, like, physical properties, and I'll shed a little bit of light on what I mean by that when we talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors in the next tutorial. But for this class, this is our definition. We could literally spend an entire class, or not class, but an entire course talking about the determinant. So this is a really deep rabbit hole, if you will. So just surface level determinant, that's how to compute it. So what's the adjugate? Well, for the adjugate, I swap the terms that are here and I negate the terms that are here. So for this, it'd be four, so four swapping here, one swapping here, negative two negating there, and negative three negating there. Okay, so we will talk about how to compute the adjugate and the determinant for larger square matrices in the next tutorial, but for now, these are the definitions. 
So why do we care about the determinant and the adjugate? Well, at this point in the course, you could say, hey, the inverse is given by this formula, at least for two by twos. Turns out that this formula holds for all n by n matrices, but at least for two by twos, at this point in the course, it's true. So here I could take one divided by the determinant times this to get this, and now I have the inverse without using that inversion algorithm. So a few things to note here, if the determinant is m, this thing is not going to be defined. So I get atomic bomb, bad things happen when I divide by the determinant if the determinant is zero. So it turns out in general, and we'll talk about this next tutorial, a matrix is invertible if and only if this thing is non-zero. So the determinant really has a lot of useful properties, one of which is it lets me quantify if the matrix is invertible or not. Okay, again, more on that next lecture. So I'll end with this example here, compositions of onto functions. If T and S are functions from say Rn to Rm and Rm to Rp respectively, not necessarily linear, then let's use the definition of onto to prove that if these things are both onto, then S of T is onto. So here, let's unpack the definition of onto for S and T first, just to see what we're working with. So here, scratch work. If S is onto, then for all Z in its codomain, so everything over here, RP, then there is a Y over here in the domain such that S of Y is equal to Z. On the other hand, if T is onto, then for everything in its codomain, so RM, then there exists something in its domain, R in, such that t of x is equal to y. Okay, so we can visualize this, right? So here I have R in, here I have R m, here I have p, and I just kind of picked a few points to work, look at here. Okay, so if s is onto, actually I start with x. So if x is onto, then for all of the points here, there's something over here that maps to it. So this would be an example here. I could, if I wanted, add a third point over here and add something over there if I wanted. Okay, so just classic onto picture. So from here, if S is onto, then that means for everything over here, there's something over here that maps to it. Okay, so if I put these together, S of T would take the thing here, go through this point, and then map it over here. And it would take this point, go through this point, and map it over here. So the basic idea is S of T has to be onto if both S and T are onto because picking a point over here, since S is onto, that says something over here will map to it. So I get something here. And since T is onto, that tells me that something over here in triangle world maps to it. Therefore, I can go from the circle through the, tri or through the square to the triangle to get that S of T is onto. So there's something in triangle that maps over to circle. Since there's something for everything in circle, there's something in square, and for everything in square, there's something in triangle. So mechanically, we're just going to take the definitions of onto and stick them together. So let's look at the formal proof. And again, this is in the other, well, not again, but this is also in the other online tutorial, so do look at it for maybe another version of the proof there. Okay, so let's write a formal proof. So let T and S be onto functions for, for these two spaces here. And now I'm going to let Z be an element of RP. So my goal is to show, so writing my goal over here, is to show that S of T is onto, right? So S of T as a function, the domain of this would be the domain of T, right? Because I start with uh, something in RN, so it goes from RN, and this maps all the way over to RP, right? So to show that this is onto, what do I need to show? Well, I need to show that for anything, so any, say, Z in RP, uh, sorry about that, RP, I need to show that there exists something in the domain, so there exists an X in RN, make that P look a bit cleaner, eh, maybe not P cleaner that way, uh, but show that there exists an X in RN such that S of T, oops, this function, evaluated at x is equal to z, okay? So here I want to start with, and I'll do it here. So here I want to start with something in z. So that's why I'm letting z be an rp, 
So since Z is an RP, I can use the fact that S is on to to go from, if I want, here's my little three sets. I can go from my RP uh, over to my RM. Okay. So since this thing is on to, I can say there is a Y over here in RM that will map all the way over here to my Z and RP. Okay, so I've gone from over here to something over here. My goal is to get something over here that maps all the way to this point Z over here, right? I've gone kind of halfway, if you will. Okay, so here, uh, finishing the, the what I was writing over here, uh, there's this Y such that S of Y is equal to Z, right? The thing over here maps over to Z. Okay, so from here, I now want to get from this S of Y, or in particular from this Y, back over to here to say some X, right? That's my goal. My goal is to get this, there exists this X. Well, how can I do that? Well, to bridge the gap from R in to R M, I can use T. T is on to, and S of Y is just an element of R M, right? So now since T is on to, there is going to exist an x in Rn such that t of x is equal to y, right? Since y was just an element of Rm, then I can get this mapping over here. Okay, so if I combine these together, thus s of t of x is going to be equal to s of t of x written this way. Well, t of x is just s of y, and s of y is just z, okay? So what I've shown is that there exists this x and r in such that this is equal to z. That is the definition of onto. Thus, for every z and rp, there exists this x and r in such that s of t of x is equal to z. So s of t is onto. So just explicitly writing in words what I kind of said verbally. Okay, so this is the total proof here. That's how to prove that this thing is onto. For a good exercise, replace onto with one to one and try that. And again, that's one of the questions that's for the online tutorial. The solution's going to be provided in the tutorial video, but try it on your own. The basic uh, style of proof that I used here works there. Just take the definitions of S and T being one to one and use those definitions to click them together in the right way to get that S of T is one to one. Okay, so that's it for here. Again, the online tutorial should be available at this bit, so feel free to look at those. Check out any of the examples that you have issues with. And again, I do recommend trying the last problem. That's explicitly doing the thing here with one-to-one. -one. Just try it on your own. If you can prove it on your own, it will be, like, that will be put you in a good spot. Okay, so that's everything, and have a good day.